The Mystery of Marie Roger by Edgar Allan Poe There are ideal series of events which run parallel with the real ones. They rarely coincide. Men and circumstances generally modify the ideal train of events so that it seems imperfect, and its consequences are equally imperfect. Thus with the Reformation, instead of Protestantism, came Lutheranism. Novalis, Moral Ansichten There are few persons, even among the calmest thinkers, who have not occasionally been startled into a vague yet thrilling half-credence in the supernatural. By coincidences of so seemingly marvellous a character, that as mere coincidences, the intellect has been unable to receive them. Such sentiments, for the half-credences of which I speak, have never the full force of thought. Such sentiments are seldom thoroughly stifled, unless by reference to the doctrine of chance, or as it is technically termed, the calculus of probabilities. Now this calculus is in its essence purely mathematical, and thus we have the anomaly of the most rigidly exact in science applied to the shadow and spirituality of the most intangible in speculation. The extraordinary details which I am now called upon to make public will be found to form, as regards sequence of time, the primary branch of a series of scarcely intelligible coincidences, whose secondary or concluding branch will be recognized by all readers in the late murder of Mary Cecilia Rogers at New York. When in an article entitled The Murders in the Rue Morgue, I endeavoured about a year ago to depict some very remarkable features in the mental character of my friend, the Chevalier C. Auguste Dupin, it did not occur to me that I should ever resume the subject. This depicting of character constituted my design, and this design was thoroughly fulfilled in the wild train of circumstances brought to instance Dupin's idiosyncrasy. I might have adduced other examples, but I should have proven no more. Late events, however, in their surprising development, have startled me into some farther details, which will carry with them the air of extorted confession. Hearing what I have lately heard, it would be indeed strange should I remain silent in regard to what I both heard and saw so long ago. Upon the winding up of the tragedy involved in the deaths of Madame L'Espanay and her daughter, the Chevalier dismissed the affair at once from his attention and relapsed into his old habits of moody reverie. Prone at all times to abstraction, I readily fell in with his humour, and continuing to occupy our chambers in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, we gave the future to the winds and slumbered tranquilly in the present weaving the dull world around us into dreams. But these dreams were not altogether uninterrupted. It may readily be supposed that the part played by my friend in the drama at the Rue Morgue had not failed of its impression upon the fancies of the Parisian police. With its emissaries, the name of Dupin had grown into a household word. The simple character of those inductions by which he had disentangled the mystery never having been explained, even to the prefect, or to any other individual than myself, of course it is not surprising that the affair was regarded as little less than miraculous, or that the Chevalier's analytical abilities acquired for him the credit of intuition. His frankness would have led him to disabuse every inquirer of such prejudice, but his indolent humour forbade all farther agitation of a topic whose interest to himself had long ceased. It thus happened that he found himself the cynosure of the policial eyes, and the cases were not few in which attempt was made to engage his services at the prefecture. One of the most remarkable instances was that of the murder of a young girl named Marie Roger. This event occurred about two years after the atrocity in the Rue Morgue. Marie 
whose Christian and family name will at once arrest attention from their resemblance. Sample complete. Ready to continue?